Remember that solids will hold both their shape and their size or volume because they have those strong bonds that no one not allow the particles to move as much. While liquids are flowing because they have weak bonds and therefore they will hold their volume but not their shape. Gas will hold neither since it has no bonds. These other states of matter will act somewhere in between these descriptions. For example, did you know that glass is its own state of matter? Glass is basically a state of matter that's called an amorphous solid. What that word means amorphous is that it does not hold its shape, which is a characteristic of a solid. Over long periods of time, glass will actually sh change its shape or flow a bit. It's just kind of like a liquid, except it's going to be much, much slower. Look here in the bottom, a picture of the structure glass. It looks very similar to the, what the liquid looks like up there. The only difference, of course, is that on the liquid, there's going to be transitional attraction between the molecules, while on the glass, the, the attraction is a little more fixed, but it's still flowing the same way the liquid does. It just flows a lot slower. And another weird thing about glass is that it will go to a strange transition. It doesn't go from solid to liquid. It goes first through a rubbery stage. You may have seen it on TV when they melt glass the way it looks like. And so glass has its own kind of technical straight up matter. It's a non-crystalline solid, so it's not really a crystal. Now you do have crystals, just like other regular solids, which don't quite act the way, actually act the way that solids are supposed to act. For example, you have plastic crystals, and these are crystals that have a, a, allow the particles to actually change directions or move around with the imposition though. So they can kind of reorient themselves even though they are kind of stuck where they are. It's more than just a vibration they would get in a normal solid though. And then you have liquid crystals where, or glassy crystals where you actually get within the crystal the molecules actually move around. So even though you actually maintain the outside shape of the crystal within it, you actually have something that looks much like actual floating material. That's very interesting. And then you also have some crystals that look like this. Every single molecule is oriented in one direction or like that. And we call those magnetically ordered crystals, which are crystals that form, for example, in special rocks that have magnetic properties inside of them, so like ferromagnetism or other things like that. And then, they, for example, rocks that form amid ocean ridges sometimes have that property. And so every single one of those things will be oriented towards one end. It's very interesting. And then also when you have a, a solid that's kind of like an in-between, between, between um, uh, two materials that can't really connect to each other, kind of like what you get when you put a oil in water and you get those two little phases, the oil doesn't really mix with the, with, the, with the water. Imagine that, but on a solid form, except that stuff doesn't really happen with oil and, and water because they would just basically freeze at different temperatures. But in the case that you do that in a solid, heterogeneous solid basically, you actually separate one substance from the other and it will look like that and we call those microphage separated solids or copolymers a lot of the copolymers do that as well so you see how those these strange states of matter that are not necessarily the same states of matter you heard about some other states of matter include the very cold states of matter one example it's actually a super cooled liquid now it's actually interesting that in every single way it will act like a liquid the molecules are still flowing they're still changing its its actual structure and shape and everything except that it holds integrity almost if it was a solid. You can see one here. Look at that. It's a super cool liquid. That's a liquid that's cooled way, way, way below the fr actual freezing point of the object, but it's not allowed to actually freeze, and so it looks like that. Super cool liquids can actually have these properties that you see there. We call them superfluids, and they get really, really close to absolute zero in a state that it's kind of like a second liquid state, and some, some materials will go through this after they are solid, actually. What's actually happening there is that the particles are moving relationship with each other within the liquid with zero viscosity. That means between the particles inside the material, there is no friction. So it acts almost like um, liquid because of that. It has infinite fluidity. However, it's technically a solid in some ways. So it's a very strange state of matter that happens close to absolute zero. Even closer to absolute zero and among solids, along particles which are made mostly of Bose-Einstein condensate. What that's called is that, you know those bosons we talked about? Imagine getting those bosons and compressing them under a lot of pressure in very, very cold temperatures, almost at absolute zero. At that point, those bosons are, most of them are occupying the same space-time state or quantum state. They're all in the same place and they will look, act like what we call a superconductor, where they, all the particles will be basically in what we call a uniform wave function. They will all be vibrating exactly the same way, one corner of it, is that the same characteristics as the other corner. I talked about that in a previous video. It's the idea of a condensate or a different state of matter where the entire particle 
all the particles act together if they were one particle. And, and that's an example right there of how that actually would look like. Similar to the Bose-Einstein condensate, if you use fermions instead of bosons, you get what's called a fermionic condensate. And it's, it'll be kind of like the same thing, but it's using fermions like quarks and leptons and things like that. And you also have some other strange states of matter, which includes the Rydberg molecules, and that will form whenever you excite uh, atoms and then allow them to actually cool down afterwards. And you get these strange conformation of matter particles. There's also something called quantum Hall states, which has to do with uh, very, very, very cold, but high voltage or magnetically oriented particles within a very, very cold substance. And you also have strange matter, which is matter that is uh, made of uh, types of quarks, which are not normal kinds of quarks. We talked about that, uh, like quark, it includes strange quarks or charm quarks or things like that. And they're going to be common in things like neutron stars. When you get stars get close to uh, very, very, very massive stars, and that and they, when they implode, what's left behind is a state that's so dense and eventually cools down to a point where you get these strange kinds of matter. And so you see there's lots of kinds of different kinds of matter. These were cold states, the einstein bose fermionic states, things like that. You also have the high-intensity state, and the most famous one is plasma. Now, how do you go from, from actual gas to plasma? Now, look the way the gas looks here, and then look at the way the plasma looks there. The biggest difference is that instead of having the electrons orbiting the nucleus like a normal matter would, the plasma has free-flowing electrons. The electrons are flowing like crazy around each other, and they're not actually a part of a atomic structure. When we learn about the atom, we learn about these electrons that flow around the nucleus. But in plasma, all the atoms are ions. In other words, they are charged particles. You're going to have these positive nucleus flowing around and these negative leptons or electrons flowing around there. And so you have charged particles all in a jumbled mass. I, I call it a soup of of fermions and it's not actually assuming the Nuraga thing. What's happening there is that the, the particle got so much energy that the electrons are started spinning so fast that they actually take off from the atom and that's how plasma looks like. By the way, you do not need heat to do this. It's possible to do it with heat and that's how stars do it. They make plasma because it's so hot that the particles have so much electrical energy but it's also possible to excite the electrons without necessarily heating them up. You know, you've seen that one, that thing that you touch and you get something that looks like lightning inside the ball, that's plasma. You can also create plasma in the microwave, I do it in class, and you can also have plasma TVs, uh, you have plasma lights, and all of these kinds of things. And so there's no uh, necessarily to be hot in order to see plasma. You probably see it every day, even though you don't notice. It's just whenever you ionize the gas. But this second power of plasma is a very strange plasma that actually breaks a law of something I just told you guys about before. It's called the quark gluon plasma. Now, imagine a state of matter where the molecules are so hot, incredibly hot, and with so much, so much, so much energy. Energy, more energy than you can possibly imagine. Something like close to what happened right after the Big Bang. At that point, the laws of physics, the four fundamental forces, instead of having four different fundamental forces, they all act together as one unified force. The laws of physics in the early universe, the first few days, the first few seconds after that explosion, it was not the same kind of universe we have today. Matter hadn't organized itself yet. The universe hadn't become a matter universe or rather than an antimatter universe. Everything was confusing. Particles were forming. They were organizing themselves in random ways. And at that point, only at that point, you actually get quarks which are not paired up together as mesons or baryons. In other words, you have quarks outside of hadrons. You have basically a, a soup of quarks, kind of like you got the soup of electrons plus hadrons in the plasma, put this to an to a extreme event. You have the gluons there, you have the quarks there, but they're not interacting together yet. That's how hot that, the matter was. Now, as the universe expanded and cooled down, you actually get to the point of formation of atoms and then formation of actual uh, hadrons and then you get atoms and then you have molecules and then you have bigger structures and so forth. Other strange, high strangers of matter include the states of matter and a gravitational singularity. Because at a gravitational singularity, you no longer have normal matter. In fact, you could argue that you don't have matter at all. Because inside of a black hole, matter is moving so fast and it's sinking to the black hole almost at the speed of light, at which point time stops for that particle. So it can't really sink into it because time stopped. So it, for that particle, it will never sink. But at the same time, it did sink. It's like one of those quantum physics kind of things, and relativity at the same time. And also, because 
it's inside the black hole and the black hole folds the space-time continuum so much as you can see here it's the gravity is folding the space-time so much that it gets to a point where at that point it's not necessarily in the universe anymore matter at the singularity point is actually out of the universe by the way once it crosses the event horizon you would need to go faster than the speed of light to actually escape this that's why not even light escapes it and so at that point is a is a point of no return you cannot go back you're going to go towards a singularity spot and you're going to stretch towards infinity and time will stop by and you technically don't fall into the singularity but you do fall into singularity and at, at the singularity you are basically out of the universe so you're not matter the same way you are anymore and all of that matter is going to be con basically added together in a very very strange state that we don't know much about yet in fact you can argue that the black hole itself is not in space-time anymore and there's no matter anymore it's just not anymore and that's uh, so awesome about it by the way this jet that's coming out of the black hole it's not actually uh, coming out of the black hole this or things that sink in the black hole this is what I call a gamma ray burst and it happens when matter is trying to sink so fast it's too much all at the same time so some of it just get pushed out and super cooked and it creates massive explosion it's the biggest explosion in the universe it's called a gamma ray burst and the things that make it are called quasars and large galaxies will tend to have that now you also can get to the point of degenerate matter which is actually what you get before you get to the gravitational singularity S stars which have or get to the supermassive ends of their lives they're going to act uh, matter is going to act different because it's under so much high pressure for example you have white dwarfs that's how uh, something like the mass of the sun or less than 1.5 times the mass of the sun stars will get to the point that they're, they're, they're going to be so close and they're going to compact those atoms so much that the plasma inside the star is going to be so compacted that the electrons will have room to move around and they will start pushing away the star because it's actually not allowing the star to implode any further than that. That's actually what causes the supernova to explode, the electric degenerate force. But in white dwarfs, that's actually what allows the nucleus to not implode any further. But if you had more gravity to begin with, it's going to compress that so much that even after the, the supernova explodes, the core will actually implode even further and actually become a neutron star. And that's if you have less than three solar masses, that's actually what's going to happen. And now, at the neutron star, what happens is those electrons are pushed in so much that they actually are forced to combine with the protons from the nucleus and actually form neutrons. And those neutrons normally are going to be unstable and actually go on under, undergo decay. But actually, this is actually the opposite of decay. They were actually combined to form neutrons, the electrons and protons, and they will stay together like that forever, and the neutrons will have uh, no room to walk around, and that will prevent the star from collapsing further. So that will be the, the neutron degenerate matter, where the neutrons are kind of so close that they're almost indistinguishable from each other. Now, at that point, the star will have these kind of layers which look different from the layers of a normal star. It will have the outside, it will have the normal plasma made of ions and electrons flowing around, and then inside of that, you're going to have the neutrons showing up. And inside of that, you might even get that Fermi plasma that we talked about, fermionic plasma, where you have basically quarks and gluons and all those constituent parties all like in a soup, but they're still forming hadrons. Now, theoretically, inside of that, you may get some quark gluon plasma, the same kind of plasma that was there in the beginning of the universe. So you see these strange stars are just a few, few examples. While ordinary matter will look like that, and then plasma will look like we would have free electrons, by the time you get so hot that you get to the electron degenerate matter, the electrons are so close that they don't allow the, the star to implode. But you can keep imploding the star even more if you have enough gravity, and you get to the point that you have those protons forming from electrons colliding with, with neutrons, and you get a true neutron star. But if you were to collide it even further, you would actually get to the point that those quarks will be freely inside the star, and it don't we will actually have the confirmation of normal matter. You will start making strange quark arrangements. You got to start, start making uh, uh, Fermi, fermionic plasma and all these strange things. No wonder the stars, supernova stars, explode because there's so much tension from those matter not wanting to be compressed so much. But even then, at least behind these super compressed stars, and if it's more compressed than that, that's when you get into the black hole. Now, if the star is even more massive than that, that's when it implodes into the singularity that we talked about, the dark black hole, where the implosion is going to be so much that it's going to implode into a singularity point, which doesn't allow matter to escape, at which point matter actually assumes a completely different state altogether. And finally, you have some other strange things, like super solid, which is a solid that does the same thing a super liquid does. It moves around without friction. And you also have string net liquids, which are strange liquids would actually act where kind of like a plasma the liquid has atoms that don't have the normal arrangement that they would normally have and it's still consistent as a liquid overall but the atoms themselves are not acting the way they're supposed to work and you also have things like super glass which is a strange kind of super fluid glass the same kind of thing as a super solid
solid and these are super cool states as well so you have all these strange kinds of matter that we're only beginning to discover and with new applications and new kinds of jobs that you might not even begin to to imagine like supercomputing and things like that so don't go out there thinking that solid liquid and gas are the only states of matter out there